this afternoon we're going to be continuing this month's theme of uh, the parables of Jesus by looking at the parable about the open and closed doors. Now the actual concept of open and closed doors in the metaphorical sense uh, is featured throughout the Old and New Testaments uh, when talking about opportunities either being presented or removed. But the parable in question sees us enter into the uh, Gospel of Luke in chapter 13 and it sits among a number of other parables too such as the barren fig tree in verses 6 to 9, the the infirm woman strengthened in verses 10 to 17, and the mustard seed and leaven in verses 18 to 22, and so on. And so first of all then, it's only right that we ask the question, what is a parable, and why are so many featured in Luke 13? Well, a parable, put simply, is a story or an account which has a moral or a spiritual lesson. Jesus used parables to illustrate the correct way in which to live a life unto God, and they represented really a key aspect of his teachings. Jesus often used parables in the Gospels to provide the congregation to which he was addressing there with this analogy that they could relate to in their life. It caused the listeners there to really think hard about the fundamental principles which are necessary to lead someone to being saved and you know, helping them to put their life into perspective. And so then these parables, then, they aren't just simply uh, nice and pleasant words for us to listen and to hear. Uh, they should really compel us to embrace the power of the gospel and, and the power of salvation. I think, first of all, it's just important for us to establish and understand the context for Luke 13. As at this stage... Jesus, in this uh, chapter here, is in some of the final days that he has on the earth before that ministry would come to an end and then he would be crucified. And so he's moving there through towns and through cities. And he's urging the individuals there to really consider their lives, you know, to look at themselves and to ask those searching questions as to the meaning of life, you know, pricking their conscience. And the parables are there to stimulate willingness with this rich and this intriguing imagery. The idea being that those with a genuine hunger to seek out truth and to seek out God will arrive at a point which moves them to the power and to the joy of the gospel, to be baptized and then to dedicate their life to God and to Jesus. And while the objective was to encourage individuals uh, in the first century when this was written, It's also just as relevant to believers that would follow in the years that would come, and even to this very day here in 2016. Now the parable of what we term open and closed doors is actually a response by Jesus uh, to a question that was being asked, and that question uh, is in Luke chapter 13. So if you just want to open your Bibles at uh, Luke chapter 13 there. And it's at verse 23. And it says, Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And this follows another question uh, just a few verses back there in verse 20, uh, where it says, Whereunto shall I liken the kingdom of God? And so Jesus is being asked a series of questions here by various individuals uh, who were in the crowds that followed him from place to place. And he answers the question there um, from verse 23 in the subsequent verses. And just as an additional thing for us to kind of think about, uh, perhaps the man asking the question here was linked to the Pharisees in some way. Because throughout the ministry of Jesus, those scribes and Pharisees were the ones that engaged in this relentless mission to uh, follow Jesus and to trap Jesus in his words and to defame and dilute that saving message that he was bringing And so perhaps the questioner here is trying to entice Jesus as to specify who would be saved and who wouldn't be saved in a typically humanistic type approach. And I say that because soon after this incident in verse 31, it tells us that uh, the same day there came certain of the Pharisees saying unto him, Get thee out and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. But anyway, that was just something for us to kind of keep in the back of our minds, just purely there for context. 
And so the answer to this question then, Lord, are there few that be saved? It is answered in such a profound and a comprehensive way by the Lord Jesus. You see, the question here, it exacts a view of everyone else. Something which human nature has a trait and a tendency to do. It looks elsewhere, it looks at the other person. But notice here how this parable, it compels you to look at yourself. This is individual. This is a self-examination. And so this brings us to a very important principle. This is absolutely crucial. And it is this. Salvation is personal. And we cannot determine the fate of someone else. We have to face up to reality ourselves. So let's just read then Jesus' response to the question and see what he has to say. It's uh, verse 23, though. It's just at the very end of that uh, verse. And he said unto them, Strive ye to enter in at the straight gate, for many I say unto you will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut to the door, and, be, and you begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught us in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. iniquity. And there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when ye shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. And there shall come from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south, and you shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there are last that shall be first, and there are first which shall be last. And so Jesus there, at the beginning of that response, he talks about this straight gate. And actually in Matthew chapter 7, we've got a parallel account of this parable. And Matthew just adds in a few more details. I've got it up on the screen there. It's Matthew 7, and it says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And the extra detail there that we've got in Matthew's account puts across this idea of either a broad way or a narrow way. The broad way, of course, is the easier route to take, isn't it? It presents us with very few difficulties. It requires less effort on our part, whereas of the narrow way, it's laden with obstacles. And it is a tough route to negotiate. The broad way alludes to sitting back, being content. But notice there in Matthew, as it says of the narrow way, it says, Few there be that find it. And to find something surely means that there is this desire to seek. There is a determination behind the motive. And so salvation will come. It will come to those who are on this quest to find the correct way. And so let's just have now a, a few moments to uh, kind of look at a few examples in our Bibles about this desire to seek and to find. And the first one, uh, we'll put it up on the screen, it's in the prophecy of Jeremiah and chapter 29. And it says, and you, sh- and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. And the key words there are obvious, aren't they? It's when and with all your heart. So faith is a fundamental aspect here. Just turn with me to Luke chapter 11. It's just a few pages back if you're in Luke chapter 13. It's Luke chapter 11 and verse 9. And it says, I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. And again, this is talking about someone finding God and finding the true way. And we can clearly see there that if there is desire, then divine assistance will be provided, it will be given. 
just come with me to uh, Matthew chapter 6. Uh, this one here is slightly different. It's um, one that we should probably know quite well, and it's really speaking about priorities. It's Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And you can see that earlier in the chapter, uh, it's talking about being content and, you know, whether the, tri uh, the trivial things of life are the main concerns, such as, you know, your food, um, clothing, and so on, and whether we're anxious about these things. But the message is clear. If someone seeks and desires to follow God, then that person has absolutely nothing to be anxious about because they have God on their side. And then finally, just in this last example, have a look at Hebrews chapter 11. It's Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him, that is God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And that verse there is key because it establishes a framework of what, what is necessary to God. And so first of all, without faith we cannot please God. It is impossible. And then we have to believe that God exists. And then finally that he will reward us if we seek him. And so again we've got this idea, haven't we, of, uh, of seeking God. You see, God isn't looking for people who have just this mild, this slight interest in him, in his principles and the plan of salvation on this earth. It's just like what we expect from a relationship, isn't it? You know, we know in friendships, if one party is enthusiastic, uh, is willing, but then the other party couldn't care less, they show very few signs of care and concern, we know that that relationship will soon fall apart. It's what we term a one-sided relationship. And neither side benefits from that. And so it's pretty clear then that if we really have it within us to seek out the true meaning to life, and if we seek and desire above all things to know the right way, then God will help us. He will intervene. And so there are two pathways that we can take. There is this uh, pursuit to uh, follow God. There is the broad way, which ultimately leads to destruction. And then there's this narrow way here, which leads to life. So in all this, where does the open and closed door come into it? Well, the closed door is judgment. It is a figurative term which speaks of an opportunity which is lost. And to illustrate this, I'd just like us to have a look at uh, Matthew chapter 25. Again, this is uh, another parable. And uh, one that we are quite familiar with, I'm sure. Matthew chapter 25. Verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, five were foolish. And they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. And afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Now this parable here, it is a, a request by the Lord Jesus Christ's disciples 
asking what sign would they have of his return back to the earth, you know, following on the, from his ascension to heaven. So what should they look for before he returns? And there are two approaches here. There are two attitudes of mind. On the one hand, we've got uh, a group which are ready, which have answered the call and who have bothered to prepare. And then on the other hand, we've got a group who didn't think it important to prepare themselves. And when the time does come, they are caught off guard. And it's only then that they begin to get themselves ready. And by then, it is far too late. And so you can see between these two groups here, they couldn't be any more different in their perspective and in their reaction to what should be done. And so then, of of the two groups there, how do we ensure that we're in that group of the five that were wise? Well, you know, the oil here in this account, it signifies the word of God. And what did they need oil in their lamps for? Well, for fuel. It was so they could see which direction they were going in. It was a source of help, a source of guidance. With oil in their lamps, they could see their way. They weren't going to stumble in the darkness. And this is exactly what the word of God can do for a believer. Psalm 119. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so a follower can use the Bible, God's word, to direct them because it provides the essential elements of what God requires of a person and how to handle certain situations in their life. And it also enlightens a believer and bringing them into this understanding of what is coming on this earth very soon. And the various steps, like baptism, are necessary to be saved. Now in Matthew chapter 25, which we just read, that last verse there, verse 13, it is very telling. Because it highlights to us that the precise day and the precise time of Jesus' return isn't something for us to know, it is hidden. Elsewhere in our Bibles, it tells us that as believers to watch and prepare because of this. And in fact, in the New Testament alone, the Lord Jesus and others use this word in, in this way, uh, watch, some 30 times. And here are just a, a few examples of what we're told about the return of the Lord Jesus. First Thessalonians chapter 5, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So it's going to come as a surprise. Revelation 16, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And so this is going to come as something totally unexpected. And in Revelation there, uh, keeping the garments or keeping clothing, it is symbolic of purity and remaining faithful. So then by you know, piecing these uh, two parables together of the open and closed doors and then the ten virgins, we can deduce that a, a closed door is the opportunity of salvation being lost and an open door is that of uh, the opportunity still being available. What we've got to keep in mind here is that although these parables are figurative, the underlying message behind them is absolutely crucial. The Lord Jesus came to guide mankind's conscience. He came to bring us to our senses. This wasn't simply just to gratify curiosity with these nice, with these pleasant words. So these things are so important. Now aside from uh, the parables which Jesus gave, we have other examples of uh, closed doors which bear great significance. One of these is in the account of Noah and the Great Flood, which occurred over 4,000 years ago, and is recorded for us in the Old Testament. So just come with me to the Old Testament. It's uh, Genesis chapter 6, right at the front of your Bible. And just up on the screen, uh, just while you're doing that, there's a basic timeline there, which uh, just gives you a bit more of an understanding of where the flood fits in, in terms of the time of Jesus and where we are now. Now we aren't going to look at this account of Noah in any great detail except just to summarise the key points from the events of the flood. 
And so the flood took place because the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Violence and corruption was prevalent. It was off the scale in that age. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And so God chose to use a, a worldwide flood in order to cleanse the earth and to effectively start again. Verse 7. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the earth, for it repenteth me that I have made them. And in verse 8, we see that uh, Noah finds grace in the eyes of God. And although God is going to cleanse the earth uh, and start again with this flood, we, he would obviously need a, a faithful family to populate the earth following on from the flood. And so he preserves faithful Noah and his family. And he instructs him to build this ark in order to survive the flood. And we see that there in verses 14 onwards. And so Noah, his family, and all those animals which were going to be preserved, they go into that ark in verse 18. But with thee will I establish my covenant, that's God to Noah. And thou shalt come in into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every thing of the all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. And they shall be male and female. And so once they went in, immediately before the waters come, God sealed the ark. It says that God shut him in. Just have a look at the next chapter. It's uh, chapter 7 and verse 16. Where it says, And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. And so that entrance there, that door is shut. It was closed. And then, following on from this, the elements unleashed uh, the waters which devoured all life on earth except of course Noah, his family and those animals which were in the ark and we should point out of course that uh, it took Noah a great many years to construct that ark and in that time period he preached that the flood would come he preached that the judgment would be coming on this earth and yet no one took any notice whatsoever but we can just imagine, you know, when those waters began to pour, that, you know, people would be desperately beating on the side of that ark, desperately trying to gain access to safety inside. And yet by then it was far too late. And so with that door being shut in verse 16, the opportunity to be saved comes to an end. And so it's clear then that the events of the flood pointed to judgment and so to summarize we, we have this door which points to the offer of salvation being available and then being unavailable being lost and the flood is obviously uh, talking about judgment coming on the earth and if we had any doubts about the account of uh, Noah pointing to judgment and pointing to baptism then we've got the first of Peter and chapter 3 which confirms it for us it says the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was, was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth now also save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so the message is crystal clear. We should not squander the opportunity that we still have. Not only are we faced by an imminent return that we have no exact date or time of, but our lives are so fragile, aren't they? We can be healthy one day and then our health can disappear. And of course, tragedy can occur at any moment in our life. James chapter 4. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, <clears throat> for what is your life? It is even a vapour that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. And so that door is currently open. 
that gift of salvation, it's right in front of us. And soon that door is going to be closed. And once that door does close, this is a permanent thing. There are no more opportunities available. No more chances. And so what will we do with our time now? The Lord Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth very soon. And when he does come, that door, that opportunity, the offer of salvation is going to be closed. Do we want that door of salvation to be shut forever? Or do we want to be included in God's family and accept the gift of salvation? If we choose to accept, then it's absolutely imperative that we seize the opportunity now and we are baptized. Because the things that we've been speaking about this afternoon are a matter of life and death. It's as blunt as that, isn't it? They're a matter of life and death. And surely the best choice is life. Thank you.